And it is now uh, my great pleasure to introduce Anna Raganskaya, a financial advisor with Blue Rider Group at Morgan Stanley and someone who is deeply committed to advancing financial sustainability in the arts, as well as bringing the cultural sector into the broader movement towards impact investment. I'm really excited about the next conversation. Please welcome Anna Ragaskaya and her panel. Thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here in such extraordinary company and I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, in the context of this forum on new models to drive greater impact in cultural philanthropy, our goal with this conversation is to situate the arts within another vital conversation, which is sustainable and impact investing. It's important that cultural organizations with endowments realize that they're also investors with a significant ability to impact society through the choices that they make in this role. By way of introduction, I'm part of the Blue Rider Group at Morgan Stanley. Uh, we're financial advisors for the cultural community. The majority of our clients are institutions, foundations, and nonprofits, but we also work with some families, artists, and patrons of the arts. Our core focus as a team is sustainable investing. We distinguish ourselves by helping our clients align their investments with their mission and values. One of the central themes we've heard so far today is for the need of the arts to better emphasize their connection to broader global issues. I think social justice has come across most profoundly through Kemi, Sean, and Kat's comments. In the business world, this connection is formalized through companies focus on environmental, social, and governance issues, or ESG, if you've heard the acronym. For cultural organizations, embracing ESG through sustainable investing is another important way to have impact on issues like environmental and social justice. So before I jump into what may come across as a technical conversation, I wanted to provide just a bit more context on sustainable investing for those of you who might be new. Uh, sustainable investing takes into consideration traditional financial return as well as measurable social or envir environmental impact. So sometimes it can be about what an organization chooses not to invest in, for example, private prisons, but more often today, it's about driving an inclusive, clean economy through the proactive investment choices you are making. For example, investing in companies working to minimize waste in their supply chains, or those companies that have strong commitments to both hiring and retaining a diverse workforce. You can take it further by investing in companies that directly address some of the greatest challenges of our time. For example, finding solutions to fight climate change through renewable energy, or alleviating poverty by providing quality jobs. And as uh, Jonathan and Jeremiah alluded to, you can even engage with the arts specifically or the creative economy, um, as some of our clients are doing with investments in affordable housing for artists, which feature on-site space for creation and performance. The sustainable investing movement has tremendous momentum. Uh, according to the United States Sustainable Investment Forum, there were $17 trillion worth of assets managed with environmental, social, and governance principles at the beginning of 2020. And that's up 42% from $12 trillion two years ago. Uh, the power of that vast amount of capital and the engagement of shareholders with corporations on sustainability issues is the reason that, for example, we have increased disclosure on wages, which is helping close the gender page gap, uh, gap the gender pay gap and also why racial diversity is increasing on corporate boards, which many of us will acknowledge still has a long way to go. We found that sustainable investing is really resonating with our arts funder clients who are really trying to do more with finite resources in a critical moment. And the conversation we're having today is about how urgent it is in this new landscape to activate all of your capital holistically in support of your values. This is about endowments, which is money you already have today and the choices you can make on what to do with it. And ultimately, it's about your power, not just as funders, but as investors to make the change you want to see in the world. We've also found that for arts organizations, embracing sustainable investing can really resonate with broader stakeholders. This includes donors from the next generation who are themselves passionate about impact investing and sustainability. But it also includes artists who are often commenting on social, political, and environmental issues in their work. Ultimately, sustainable investing helps organizations better align their capital with their distinct values. And at the Blue Rider Group, we have worked with many foundations, nonprofits, and families on that journey. Uh, importantly, I wanna emphasize these are all market rate investments and it's not a trade off of values for performance. Uh, there's significant data that investing sustainably actually enhances investment returns. And we'll talk about some of these fiduciary concerns and how to broach this conversation with your investment committees and board on our panel. So I'm thrilled to be joined today by representatives from two leading artist foundations. So Casey Moore, who's the CFO of the Andy Warhol Foundation, and Sandy Lee, the treasurer of the Joan Mitchell Foundation, as well as Claude Grunitsky in his role as a trustee of Mass MoCA, which is one of the largest contemporary art museums in the country. And with that, we'll jump right into our conversation. 
So my first question um, was for all of the panelists, but Claude will kick us off. Uh, can you explain the mission of the organization you represent and briefly tell us how sustainable investing fits into that mission? Why is it important? Thanks, Anna. It's such a pleasure to be on this panel. It's just been such a wonderful series of discussions, imaginations. And, and, and I wanted to maybe start um, by explaining that I'm really speaking as a trustee of MassMoCA, which is, as you said, a, a really, um, I want to just use the word groundbreaking um, cultural institution in America. But I'm speaking as a trustee in a very, very difficult year where we've had to deal with, with, with furloughs and, and, and with, with layoffs. And thank God for PPP, we were able to get a million dollars to in the dark days of springs to keep going. But the, the reason I, I, I'm, I, I'm a little bit emotional when I talk about the difficulty of being a trustee in a, in, in, at this time in America is, you know, I just arrived in, 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 in France yesterday. And when I landed, you know, I always do the first thing I do is I turn on Le Monde, the application of the French newspaper, and I look at the top stories. And, and uh, the top story was obviously about uh, former President Sarkozy possibly going to jail for corruption. But then one of the, the third biggest story in Le Monde's uh, app yesterday was about American museums and how they lost $30 billion this year. And, and the average museum lost about $850,000 in income, in, in income this year. And the total amounts to $30 billion. And I just realized how much of a crisis it is. And then I was wondering why is Le Monde publishing this article at this moment about American museums? The answer was obvious. In France, these museums, and I work with a couple of those French museums, all they do is, you know, they just have to ask the government for money and the Ministry of Culture will cut a check year after year. And they don't have to do the same song and dance that we have to do. You know, sometimes the song is different. Sometimes the dance is different, but we're always hat in hand asking for money. And, 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 the, and I, I don't know which system is better because we're always in the song and dance, but I do want to acknowledge the fact that there's something really rewarding about the active solidarities that come with uh, foundations like Andy Warhol, like Joan Mitchell that, that support uh, our, our, our work. I mean, you know, we've been very lucky to have um, Mass Mocha, Mitchell, you know, gave us, you know, money for the Blame the Stern Cry exhibition. And then, you know, Sanford Bigger is one of my close friends and, and an artist who I really, really love. You know, that $50,000 to support his exhibition came in handy. Uh, Liz Glenn, 2017, we got 75,000 from the Warhol Foundation. This is real money for institutions like ours that are always living on the edge, always living on the edge because we don't necessarily get as much state funding as we should, even though in our case, we've been fortunate to have the state of Massachusetts really support us. But this whole thing got me thinking of Europe versus America and how um, in America, we're just left for, to fend for ourselves. And there has to be some level of solidarity in, in terms of the way we support each other. And that's why I was really impressed and, and really moved by the way that Sean Leonardo so spoke about what does it actually mean to fund a relationship? Is it something about instant gratification or is it something about I'm looking at the long-term relationship and how we can actually grow? And at Mass Mocha, the only reason we've survived um, for the past 33 years under very adverse conditions is because of these active solidarities and, 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 and about, well, in this case, sometimes we have to um, make a few compromises just to keep going. And I wanna talk as we keep going in this discussion about what some of these compromises might be. Great, um, I'm gonna have Casey uh, follow on those comments. Absolutely, I'm delighted to be here with all of you. <clears throat> and I will say, uh, Claude, that you've um, struck a nerve with your concept of relationships. And I think that's one thing that the Warhol Foundation really attempts to do with all of the organizations um, that it funds. Um, per Andy's will, the mission of the foundation can basically be summed up in six words which is the advancement of the visual arts. And the foundation's board uh, and grant staff um, has determined that the way that we're going to best accomplish that is to fund the creation exhibition and documentation of contemporary visual arts writ large. And we fund work that is er experimental, under-recognized, sometimes challenging, but the forefront 
of all of the work that the foundation does centers on artists. Artists are absolutely the bottom line for the Warhol Foundation. And I think that that's important, particularly in um, the conversations that we're having now, because it's become clear that artists need funding not only for their work, but also for their very existence. And I think that that's something that the Warhol Foundation has striven to do in the last um, particularly 10 years, um, but throughout the, the 33 year life of the foundation. And one of the reasons that um, ESG strategies are have become important to the Warhol Foundation is because ESG strategies are again at the heart of a lot of the work that the institutions that we fund do and also very important to um, the artists who are part of those, the work that those institutions do. And um, so that socially responsible investing aligns with the work of um, many of the funded organizations and also the, the work that our, our, our artists care about. Thanks, Casey. And I'll cue Sandy. Hi, thank you, Anna, for organizing this panel and for bringing us together. I, um, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the Joan Mitchell Foundation and we're so happy to be a part of this conversation, which I think the other panelists uh, also feel could last for days. So I know we have a short time to hit a few points. Um, what we do is we support the essential contribution of artists to society. And I'm so glad that we are starting closer to the end of this program because we've all had a chance to be reminded of the range of work that artists do for our communities and in our communities um, and around social, social justice issues. Um, what I think is super interesting um, about this in particular <laughs> is that uh, Claude is here uh, representing Mass Mocha, the venue, the, the sort of the permanent venue for contemporary artists. Casey is here for an organization that is that is there to support exhibitions, that is there to support um, gathering people to talk about a certain item, to, to showcase voices. Um, and at the Jen Mitchell Foundation, we specifically support individual artists, the producers of the work that we as a community, we as a society benefit from. Um, it is a, as, as Claude has mentioned, it is a dire, it is a dire time. Um, in this industry, even with uh, museum layoffs, the knock-on effect to individual artists who serve as museum educators, who have their second and third jobs to be able to support their art make making, um, it, it is it's a difficult time for all of us. Um, in terms of sustainable investing and and the why, uh, we we at the foundation wish to better align our financial work with our core mission. Um, and for us, if sustainable investing, as Anna, you so thoughtfully shared, um, if it produces better results and it is um, a better reflection of our own values, it's not only reasonable to be able to be look to, to look at this, but it's also in our self interest for our portfolio and as, as stewards of our portfolio. Um, so I'm super happy to be here to to talk about how to move forward uh, on some of these questions. Thanks so much. So to make this maybe a little more concrete for our audience, I was hoping that um, starting with Casey, you might be able to share kind of an ESG example, both from your grant making work and then also from your investing work and how those two might interrelate. Sure, and, and I'd like to go back to and reference something that, that Sandy said, which is um, that artists are really suffering at this point in terms of um, losing jobs and uh, losing um, potential work. So not only losing not only losing jobs um, that may put the food on the table and the roof over their heads, but also losing potentially losing commissions, losing exhibitions, having things be um, postponed. And one of the things that the Warhol Foundation has done, to try to stem that tide is through our re-granting re program, which we expanded from 16 to 32 cities for a total of $3.2 million annually to directly assist artists in need. 
And basically our 32 partners will use their $100,000 grants to fund emergency needs, including rent, medical costs, childcare, um, and so forth. And we believe in the importance of getting money on the ground to the artists who may not qualify for other sources of funding. And I think that the, the reason why this is so important is that because of the partnerships that we have in 32 cities across the United States, the people who work in those partnerships know where the creative work is happening in their cities. And so we've relied on them to help us get money to where it's needed most. And um, because those partners have um, regular contact with vulnerable artist populations in their communities, they really know where the need is greatest. And I think that um, one of the most important things, again, going back to relationships, is that we have a relationship with each of those 32 partners and they rely on us to provide the funding and we rely on them to get that funding to where it's, where it's most needed. And there are other um, organizations that we fund, for example, um, Black Lunch Table is an artist foundation, I'm sorry, an artist founded organization. And they really support work both in the physical space to encourage critical dialogue, but also um, in the digital space. And I think that's become increasingly important um, in the pandemic because obviously we're not congregating physically and we are um, looking at organizations like the Black Lunch Table for their work in the, in the digital world. Um, with regard to sustainable investing, I think that one of the most um, amazing examples of sustainable investing that has happened um, in, and in terms of impact investing is Matt Moore, who was a 2008 Creative Capital grantee and Creative Capital is funded by the Warhol Foundation. Um, his Greenbelt hospitality has become a candidate for socially responsible investing and impact investing. And I'd like to quote him um, because I think this is really, really the heart of the matter. And that's, he says, money follows creativity we have to talk about money because we're talking about livelihoods, getting artists paid wages that they deserve and being a critical part of the economy. So that's, I think, really crucial to our approach for not only our grants program, but also for our foray into socially responsible investing. And we will continue to make inroads in terms of um, both ESG and also impact investing as those opportunities become available. And I, and I wanna add that the Warhol Foundation's move of, of I think approximately 25% of your endowment into uh, socially responsible investing is sort of a, um, I think a barometer, I think we're, with where the field could go overall. And I think that that's an important first step. And I think it's very important for the field that you're talking about it. So thank you for sharing your experience with us. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll move on. And to I, can I just add that we at Mass Mocha have also moved part of our endowment. It's not a huge endowment, but it's a, it's a sizable endowment for a museum like ours. And part of it has been also moved to ESG initiatives. This is something that happened in the last 12, 12 months because our, our, our chairman, Timur Galen, is really a visionary when it comes to ESG and, and, and really radical change in that respect. So it's something I'd like to discuss. That sounds great, Claude. Uh, do you want to maybe jump in and continue if you want to share a little bit more about how that strategy is being implemented and then we'll have Sandy finish off. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, well, you know, in terms of the, these ESG narratives that you alluded to, I mean, we're, we're a very large museum, large in the sense of not maybe large in respect, with respect to our balance sheet, but, but large with respect to square footage, right? We have 600 and 50,000 square feet, which is roughly the, the size of the Louvre. And, and we have 28 buildings. And, 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 and um, about a quarter of those buildings are powered by, by solar and renewable energy. So that's a really important uh, part of our EIST strategy looking forward. And this is not something that's new for us. We've been doing this for a long time. And it was always in the vision of um, Joe Thompson, our outgoing director and, and founder that, that sustainability was gonna be really, really crucial. But then the way that we're looking at ESG now is, is also 
you know, I guess social justice is what, what is, is how we would describe it, even though I, I, the, the word is kind of overused at this moment, but we're really looking at the issue of, of race and, and, and when you're coming from a really underserved community like Mass Moca that, you know, had to deal with mass unemployment, that had to deal with major societal ills, teenage pregnancy, crime, it, you know, when you're coming from that perspective, you're trying to uh, reinvigorate an area through the arts, you really have to think laterally. And, and one of the things that we're struggling with right now as a board at Mass Moca is how to deal with racial justice when the community is just so white. I mean, usually when I'm in there and I'm walking across those 650,000 square feet, I may do all of that and, and not see a, a single other person of color. And that's a real issue. And, and I think that in order to deal with it, uh, we have to recognize that as, as Kat Gunn said, somebody has to give away uh, that seat at the table, right? She said, it's sometimes about giving your seat away. And I think that's really important. And as we try to change the makeup of the board, of the leadership team at Mass Mocha, and even as we try to attract more visitors that are not just from the Berkshires or that are not just white from, from, from the Berkshires, we have to think of, of, of novel ways to attract uh, visitors to new programs, which is why we're looking at, at new uh, fellowship programs and internship programs so that the few people who actually decide to work at Mass Mocha don't feel like they're the odd man or odd woman out. And, and these are very real things that we're doing. And it, it also has to, has to deal with partnerships because as um, Jeremiah said, there a few of us are living in that liminal space, right? He specifically spoke about American Africans like, 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 like ourselves. He's Nigerian American, I'm Togolese American, but we always have to live in that liminal space, right? It's not the double consciousness that W.E.B. Du Bois spoke about, but it's really, okay, how do I bring my blackness to a white institution and try to be the change agent as opposed to being the quiet one in the corner? And I feel that as Kat Gunn said, if there are more people around the table, then that will allow us to strike more partnerships and bringing, bring in other perspectives from people who may not necessarily be invited to discussions around the future of institutions like Mass Mocha. And, and I think that the same approach that we're adopting for climate change um, and, and, and dealing with that, I think that uh, we're dealing with that with uh, the way that we're diversifying our staff, our board, and, and it also has to do with territory. So we're in an area of the Berkshires that again, had to deal with many factory closings and, 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 and mass unemployment. And, and, and it was great that so many entrepreneurs stepped to the plate and started building affordable housing uh, or, you know, one of our big supporters, Jack Wadsworth, he actually built a boutique hotel right across from Mass Mocha. It's called the Porches in order to attract the people as well. And then that leads to more community infrastructure. And, and I think that that's really, really important. And then the gender debate is also a big one. And so as we tackle these things, it's not about, oh, okay, let's just pay lip service to ESG. Let's do environment. Let's do social. You know, it's about how do we bring in real partners, real entrepreneurs, real social, social uh, change agents in order to kind of create change in a community that was always kind of forgotten. And so, I mean, we're very proud of the fact that we have 300,000 visitors a year, but we're not in New York City. We're not MoMA that gets two and a half million visitors a year. We don't have access to the funders in the same way. So the song and dance has to get very, very creative in order for us to survive. And it's again, about survival uh, for, for institutions like ours, even though I'm going to jump over to Sandy Lee just so we can make sure we uh, talk a little bit about like sort of the tactical and more implementation question. I know we just got a question in the chat about this as well. I'm sorry to cut off. But oh, thank you. Um, I'll answer quickly. I know we've uh, got limited time. On social, on the grant making side, uh, we fund $25,000, $25,000 fellowships every year. And uh, we often uh, fund artists at crucial points in their careers. Uh, we fund people who are national, um, who are chosen by a jury of their peers. Um, I, my background is uh, uh, Joan Mitchell's first uh, major museum solo exhibition work in the 1970s. That was 30 years after she had started painting. So it's a reminder to me of how long uh, the arcs of these artists' careers are. And st stitching it back to Jeremiah, like we are investing in visionaries. And so there's that piece on the grant making side, how it ties to um, what we do on the sustainable investing side. Um, 
as, as Catherine had mentioned earlier, the art market is not necessarily a reflection of the worth of an artist's work. And so um, can, we, can we show up? Can we keep asking the questions about our portfolio that we ask in the art field? And how do we keep aligning our work on one side with the work on the other side? On environmental, uh, we run a residency in New Orleans. We also have provided emergency grants uh, post uh, weather events. Uh, we're so glad that we can do that, but that's a band-aid. Those are band-aid approaches. And uh, for us, we think there is value in, in investing in the systematic uh, questioning around climate and about extreme weather. And so that's where what we do on the investing side really starts to come together with what we do on the grant making side. Thanks so much. Casey, is there anything you might want to add about kind of the process with your board before I? Uh, yeah, I mean, we made the decision to go uh, very quickly into 25% of the, the 25% of the portfolio would go to SRI strategies. And we're continuing to look at other places in the portfolio where um, ESG and SRI strategies might be employed. I think the important thing for me is that just take the first step, just understand that socially responsible investing doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be incremental. It should be incremental. Um, you don't have to jump in, dip your toe in, get used to the water, make sure you, that your board understands that, um, you know, while mission specific opportunities may not be available uh, right now, that there are any number of ESG and SRI strategies that can be employed for vast portions of most portfolios. So um, don't be afraid, just go forth and do it. Thanks so much. Um, I will leave you all with just a few parting thoughts. So this conversation is really meant to be a call to action. So I hope that the connection between your work in the cultural community and your potential impact as investors is at least a little bit clearer. I especially like that example about Joan Mitchell's work in New Orleans and some of the thoughts they have on climate investing. Um, Tactically, this field has evolved tremendously. It used to be really about exclusionary investing, but now it's much more about being proactive. And there's really a tremendous amount of data that investing this way is actually a smarter way to invest. Throughout the peak of the COVID crisis, sustainable funds outperformed their traditional peers by nearly 4%. And as Sandy alluded to, that really means significantly more funds for grant making, programming, and mission for organizations. So a real win-win. Since technology is a major theme here, I wanna add that technology has really made it much easier for investors to understand what they currently own. And I would argue with dipping your toe in the water, a good sort of first step is understanding what you're currently invested in. And Morgan Stanley has in particular done a lot of work on this front. Uh, so to leave you with a new model and a takeaway, it's really to think holistically about all sources of capital that support your mission. Treating investing and philanthropy not as two separate conversations, but as functions that can work in tandem, driving more funding to the arts and to the vital systemic issues that the arts address in our society. For cultural institutions, this is a $60 billion question. There's much greater economic impact in the engine that drives them, which is the foundation world. So it's really important that we all become more vocal in this conversation. So thank you and back to Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, so much for your partnership and for leading that great discussion. And thanks to Claude, Casey, and Sandy for joining us and sharing your expertise with us.